Kelly from the Berwick Public Library. I'm very excited to bring you our next speaker, Dan Gardoki from Leading with Nature. Dan is a Southern Maine resident. He has over 30 years experience in teaching and he's a registered Maine guide. He has helped people reconnect and deepen their understanding and appreciation for nature for over 30 years. In 1999, together with a couple of colleagues, Dan founded White Pine Programs. And for 20 years, he served as their executive director. Well, now Dan has founded Leading with Nature. Through Leading with Nature, he offers consulting, mentoring, and training, as, long as, as well as teaching people how to cultivate a better understanding of how nature heals, challenges, and inspires us to be more conscious and awake human beings. This past year has been a difficult one for so many of us. But the positive benefit of staying safe at home has allowed us to slow down and get outside and enjoy our surroundings. You don't have to go far. You can just be in your backyard or here at the library to be present, reflect, and listen. So thank you to Berwick Community TV for partnering with us to bring you this great program and for Dan Gardoki for coming to the library to inform us about talking with birds, finding mindfulness and nature connection in your own backyard. Hi there, my name is Dan Gardoki uh, from Lead with Nature. I'm excited today to be with Berwick Public Library to share a little bit about um, what I'm calling talking with birds. So how to find nature connection and mindfulness right in your own backyard. So let's start with a little story. Once upon a time, way back when, all the animals spoke the same language. And that includes the people. Now it's easy to forget that as human beings we are in fact mammals, therefore we are in fact animals. And we belong to the world of animals. Uh, you know, there's the world of plants, fungi, all these other things. We are, in fact, animals. Uh, you know, we have all the things mammals have. And um, we've created a world or a habitat for ourselves as humans that's pretty interesting and unique to humanity. But that doesn't mean we can't continue to understand and connect with the rest of the wild. So, that time when people and animals spoke the same language, I heard that start to a story probably when I was a teenager, and I thought, Whoa, what was that like? That must have been really interesting. And what does that even mean? <laughs> now, it was an old indigenous story from the Northeast here, um, part of North America. And I was, I was just really curious about what that meant. You know, I was like, am I picturing people like actually this strange foreign language where like, you know, they're all talking it? And I was like, no, I don't think it's that literal. <laughs> and the more I started to, to understand nature by spending a lot of time in nature, um, just like a lot of other folks probably watching today, the more I started to understand that, well, wait, we can understand and interpret the world around us. And for me, the most useful way to do that has been by what I'm calling talking with birds. Now, I'm not expecting people to be able to walk outside and go <whistles> and make crazy interesting bird calls, although some people can. Uh, it's a strange, weird habit of mine that I enjoy and uh, a skill set I've been working on for a long time. But that's not what I mean by talking with birds. What I mean is being in dialogue with the wild, dialogue with the world around us, with a more than human world. So when we're in dialogue with the more than human world, we're actually giving and receiving information. Maybe you're a gardener, maybe you're a landscaper, maybe you're a hunter, maybe you're a, um, you know, someone who just really appreciates trees and you're an artist uh, and you paint them. But you probably have some sort of connection with nature if you're bothering to watch me talk about this right now. I'm guessing you have some sort of interest. So whatever that interest is, think about the ways that you find connection, the reasons why you do it. What, 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 what makes it worth it? Why do you bother driving a couple hours to go on a long hike in the mountains and you know, exhaust yourself and you know, drive all the way back home trying to stay awake? What is it about that time in nature? And I think it's connection. We're seeking a deeper connection with all the rest of this world, with the more than human world. It includes humans, but it's more than human. And that includes beautiful places. Uh, on a day like today, 
October in southern Maine. Just absolutely gorgeous colors, right? Wonderful warm sun in the sky, you know, a little chilly in the morning. Um, it just makes you feel alive, at least it does for me. So today what I hope to do is to share some stories, give you some how-to techniques, and, uh, and also go outside and share a little bit about what we're hearing and seeing right outside, you know, the Berwick Public Library, which might as well be your neighborhood or your backyard. So we're going to do a little bit of that. Um, yeah, and I'll share some tips and tricks that I've learned over the years, some shortcuts so it doesn't take you as long as it took me to, uh, to learn some of these things and to find some of the, 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 um, the wonderful components of, of spending more time in nature, including things as simple as mindfulness and peace and well-being. And, uh, you know, it's, we're living in a pretty wild time right now with a major pandemic and all sorts of other things going on that are a bit stressful for people. So any little thing we can do to find wellness, I think, is welcome. And we're going to do a little bit of that today, too. So let's head outside. Ooh. Great. So here we are. Welcome back. We're outside. And we're outside the Berg Public Library here on Old Pine Hill Road. And right behind me is a stunning specimen of the sugar maple, probably one of the best known October fall colors here in our region. Gets these absolutely gorgeous yellow oranges in its uh, leaves as the chlorophyll drains away on the cold nights and the leaves are about to fall. The other colors that have been there the whole time, they show up, which is kind of cool to think about. Anyway, uh, we can talk about trees all day, but we're gonna talk more about birds a little. As we walked outside, um, there was just a quiet little like that kind of flying over. And those were what we call contact calls. And just like you and I and our families, and we have to kind of have quick little chats back and forth, birds do the same thing. Short, sharp little calls. Right now, they're, we're hearing, let's see if we hear them again, little noises that sound like hack, 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 hack. It's almost like little wind up toys. They're really funny. Or little tiny bugles. Meep, meep. There. Meep, meep. These are nuthatches. And so my goal here today isn't to like have you learn every bird by its sound. That's just not a realistic goal. And it's not really what we're talking about. But what we're talking about is just listening and paying attention. So if we want to be in communication with what's happening around us in dialogue, first thing we have to do is slow down and listen. <laughs> that sounds really simple. But as you, I know for me, uh, I can have a busy life, I can have a lot of things on my mind, I can be distracted by other things, and not that distractions are always bad, but there's things I have to take care of and things I need to tend to. But if you carve off a little chunk of time to just go outside somewhere and quietly sit, stand, quietly walk about a little bit, and just start to listen. There you go. And you don't even have to know what the names are. Just listen to what's happening around you. Listen to the wind, listen to the birds, Listen to the cars. <laughs> They're part of the scene too. When it gets quiet, you'll hear more birds. You might hear squirrels rustling in the leaves. That's time of year. Chipmunks, right? Kind of freaking out and alarming when little cats walk by and things like that. So we're going to go around the back of the building here in a second. And um, I'm going to give you a little bit of an over overview of the general kinds of sounds to listen to for birds and then one in particular that should really grab your attention and that might help you see and have more interesting interactions with other wildlife. So we're going to go do that now. But there's red-shouldered hawks calling over there. Or they could be jays mimicking the red-shouldered hawks, but that So here we are, sitting on a stump behind the library, <laughs> and you um, can hear some traffic going by, some action in the nearby neighborhood. And so, you know, this is what I encourage you to just, if you know, if you want to find some ways to better understand and connect to nature, we really do have to slow down. We really do have to make it a priority to give nature our attention. And I'd say right now, <laughs> as human beings, our attention is probably one of our most valuable commodities to the world. And 
many people are vying for it all the time. So for instance, I have to, I, I'm, I just silenced my cell phone or turned it off so it does not give me any notifications and distract me because that's going to take me out of this moment and it's going to put me into this little world of, of focus and it's going to be really hard to give my attention out there if it's right here. So if you, you know, if, if you're going to go, if you want to spend some time in nature and learn from nature, it's going to be important to make that your priority and turn those, put those distractions away if possible. Uh, which generally, you know, you, most people, we can figure it out, small doses. So this time of day, it's uh, early afternoon. It's not known to be the most birdy time of day, but again, when, we, when I talk about this talking with birds thing, it's not just about birds. Birds are a great ambassador or gateway for us to connect with nature. There we got chickadee dee dee dee, the main state bird. But it's also chipmunks and squirrels and deer and everything else because animals are all communicating a lot of the time. And in fact, I would say, I think we're the only animal that's not listening. <laughs> all the animals are listening to each other. And they have to. It's how they stay safe. That's how they understand what's going on around them. So those chickadees up there are communicating both to each other. But they're also, you know, whether it's intentional or not, it's hard to say, but other animals are listening to them. So the chipmunk down below, here's the chickadee. The chipmunk starts, starts to alarm, the chickadee's gonna go over and see what's going on with the chipmunk. And vice versa. If the chickadees start to do their alarm, which often is chickadee dee 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 dee, usually the more D's, the more trouble there is nearby. Sometimes they just get upset with each other, but often it's say a little a bird of prey that, that could easily capture and, and eat and kill them, eat them. That's what they have to do to make a living. So the chickadee doesn't seem too upset right now. It's kind of there's a little flock and it's chickadee dee and like that and they tend to be super social and sometimes a little crabby and interactive so that leads me to what are we really trying to listen to so if you're outside and you hear birds making noises and maybe you're not terribly familiar with the birds that's fine you don't have to know all of them you don't have to know their names if we break down the kind of voices of the birds the kind of like what are they trying to say I would put them into five categories there's happy birds Yes, I know that I may not be truly happy, but some may be, who are we to say? But that would be when birds are singing. So classic examples, like say a cardinal, or a robin, things like that. They're singing their song. Um, that means often it's terrible. They're, you know, they're, they're often trying to attract mates and things like that. We're just gonna call that happy voice. Nothing, they have no major concerns in that moment. They're able to sing. Then there's chatty. And we just had that over there, little contact calls or chatty voices of birds when they're just maintaining social bonds and, and moving around and saying, oh, over here, check it out, there's some ants. Oh, look over this, there's some, there's some, uh, you know, some little crickets or whatever it is. You know, and turkey flock might be pick, 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 pick. <laughs> So come on, those are their chatty voices. So we have happy and we have chatty. And then we go to crabby. And crabby's when the birds aren't too happy with each other, but they're not like, they're not super upset, but they're just, usually a little bit um, aggressive with each other. So picture birds and a bird feeder, and one comes in, you know, and is feeding, and the other one comes right in, maybe a titmouse, you know, their song is <whistles> but when they're upset, it's <whistles> so that would be their crabby voice sometimes. Then we have the hungry voice, which is usually made by the young birds, whether they're little nestlings in the nest, begging, <whistles> are you begging and just insistent, you can just feel it. You feel like, oh my God, someone feed that thing, please. And then when they're fledglings, after they leave the nest, they follow the parents around and they'll still be begging. <laughs> and they'll be, be flatting their little wings going <laughs> And you see parents shoving food down their throat like, gosh, please stop, this is driving me nuts. So that's that fourth voice. And we're not hearing a lot of that right now. We're past most of the baby birds, almost all the baby birds are now pretty much grown up, so to speak. But the last voice is the one that we really want to pay attention to. And that's the voice of fear. <laughs> a scared bird. So happy, chatty, crabby, hungry, and scared. The scared voice is the voice of alarm. When a bird is alarming, the bird is telling everyone who can hear. And, and you know, vocal alarms are great. They, you know, versus just like going, ah, like going like silently. Most people aren't going to get that message unless they're looking at you. But if you go, ah, then ever, sorry, someone's, everyone's going to get that message instantly because they can hear it and see it probably. So birds will alarm when they're truly concerned with their own safety and well-being. Now, as humans, again, we often aren't paying attention to this, and we're often causing birds to alarm all the time. 
say I pull up here at the little penny pond trail or something, get out of my car and just start stomping into the woods really fast, any little bird feeding on the ground up there is going to go, they're just going to take off. They're going to fly off the doves, the robins, whoever it is, the juncos, because we're not actually conscious of the fact that they're there using that space. I mean, it must be like if you were in your kitchen and some stranger just came barreling in <laughs> out of the blue right to your table and started grabbing your food. You'd be like, what? What is going on? So I want to encourage people. I know it's not the same, but if you want to make a deeper connection to these animals, these birds, you got to give them some respect. And we often don't even know we're not giving them respect. And by giving respect, we just want to give them space. So if there's a bird feeding on the ground over here or between me and the car, and I want to get to the car, well, I can just go the other way around the building, or I can just wait 30 seconds. And that bird's probably going to stop feeding and move on. So how we conduct ourselves, how we conduct ourselves around wildlife um, is going to change the way that wildlife actually interacts with us. This is true. I've seen, I've seen this over time, and not always, but often this is going to be true. If you've got regular resident birds living near you in your home, where you work, in a park, anywhere, and they get to know you because of the way you treat them, they will actually be more tolerant of you. They'll let you get closer to them. They'll let you observe them more, uh, more closely. And they won't freak out when you come around. And they can tell the difference, folks. This isn't, and this is just me making this up. There's tons of science on this. When I worked on a book called What the Robin Knows, How Birds Reveal Nature's Secrets, great book. Our author is John Young, and I did the science and audio editing for the book. I had to get all the science to show that, yes, birds are very, oh, Robin's just alarmed. Birds are very selective about um, what, what kind of noises they make and when they make them. So these robins are now going, tut, 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 tut. Right there. Tut, 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 tut. That's, that could be crabby or that could be scared. So I want to see, where is that bird? And this is what you want to do. If you hear a noise that sounds like, what is that bird doing? Try and get some visual and then try and get to understand the body language. Just like if someone is, you know, you're at work and someone's saying, hey, you know, and you look over, uh, you want to see what they're doing with their body. If they're just like, hey, nice to see you and waving. Great. That's just chatty. If they're saying, hey, 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 you know, like, whoa, okay, then maybe they're scared or something's going on. That's urgent. I need to get over there now. So what I'm doing now is I'm trying to find this Robin. I haven't seen it yet. And I'm looking for its body language. Is it just relaxed and sitting on the tree, making a couple little tuts? Is it pointing and bending over and kind of like making a lot of its body language and it's, it's telling me, hmm, it's pointing maybe towards trouble or something's got its attention. And so, so what we do, we just give our attention to the birds and we try and see what happens because often they will reveal all sorts of things we're not noticing. Um, one day I was on a conference call um, and a lot of us are on calls right now, or Zoom calls, and this and that for work or things. Maybe you're sitting there, and I'm looking out my window in the yard, and I see robins. And robins, our American robins, tend to feed on the ground in the spring and summer and fall. In the winter, they go up in the bushes a bit. And there's robins feeding on the ground, and they're moving, and they're stopping, and they're pulling up little worms, you know, and they do a little do 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 run, run, pack, pack, pull, 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 and they're eating these worms. And uh, all of a sudden, I see this robin stop. And I was like, okay. Another robin, frozen solid. They're like bird sickles. I mean, it's like someone shot them with a little freeze gun and they're just frozen in place, like moving. It looked like they're moving and someone just froze them. And I was like, well, that's weird. And then I saw the robin's bill slowly open like that, but I couldn't hear it because there was a glass window in front of me and I was on a call. So I was like, oh my goodness. So I said, oh yeah, I just kind of pretended to be paying attention to the call because I really was paying attention to the birds. Sorry, whoever was on the call. It's like, yes, exactly. And I kind of put it back on mute. I put the phone down and I snuck out to the other room where I could crack open the window to see what was going on. And when I cracked the window, I could see the robin and that robin was giving that voice of, of alarm. And for, they have many voices sometimes that can be alarm or scared, but it was going like super high pitch. I'm not sure if you can hear that, but and these are known as seat calls. If you're outside and you hear a really high pitched, almost hard to locate C kind of call, that usually means there's a very scared bird nearby. And that usually means that that bird sees trouble really close and it's afraid to even move. It doesn't want to reveal itself because it's afraid it might get caught and killed. So in this case, I was like, whoa, that's a seat call. That's, that's a scared bird. And I start looking, where's the trouble? I couldn't see it. So I went upstairs in my house, one level from the bay. I was in the basement. And when I got to the first level, I can look out on the trees and sure enough, right in the trees, 
10 feet off the edge of the house was a broadwing hawk. And this broadwing hawk was just sitting there looking and staring and looking intently and staring and trying to be like, where are those birds? I just saw them. You know, like you probably saw them moving, came in and landed. They all froze. You picture the back of a robin. Think about what color it is. If it's on like a dirty brown, this is like a brown soil, it was a perfect camouflage. So they couldn't see them and they were frozen in place. So they weren't moving. So it couldn't really tell where exactly they were. Um, so I just kind of looked at the hawk and I knocked on the window and waved to it and then it flew away. Which wasn't super nice of me for the hawk's sake, but it was for the robin's sake. So, you know, good, bad, who knows. <laughs> so there are moments when we can, we can choose to tune into birds whenever we have a few minutes. And again, the birds are the gateway, right? In the distance here, I just heard a little chipmunk. And a chipmunk does that little alarm call you may know. Right now, this year, 2020 in Maine, one of the things that's been abundant is chipmunks in our region. We have a ton of them. We had a couple great years of acorns. The squirrel numbers were really down last year after being up the year before. So the, ache, the chipmunks have gone crazy and they bred like mad. And we got a lot of them. And the chipmunks will do their little tss, tss, tss. Oh, there's one. I think I just made one move. Sorry, I need a little water. They do a high pitched chip, which is why we call them chipmunks, by the way. And they sound like birds. And then when they go in their hole, <laughs> now that call from a chipmunk usually means there's something coming on the ground that they don't like. We call them, I'll call them ground predators. Even though you're probably not intending to go and kill and eat that chipmunk, it sees you as a threat. So there's a ground threat coming. Now, if that chipmunk makes a different call and you see it sitting there looking up and going, <whistles> or cluck, 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 almost like a clucky chickeny call, that usually means there's an aerial threat. And they'll do this when hawks are circling or hawks are nearby. So wild animals, just like us, need to have communication and alarms and vocalizations that require a different response in order for someone to be safe. So for instance, if um, we're walking down the street and someone's moving a piano and, it's, and I see it falling off straps and coming down towards your head, I'm not going to say, don't move. I'm going to say, run, <laughs> because I want you to not get hit by a piano. Whereas if there's a car coming like right by you and you're about to walk into traffic, I'm going to say, don't move, because I don't want you to walk into traffic. So there are responses that, we, that, we, that are encoded in these language that these birds, these animals are, are sharing that tell other animals what to do or not to do. And here's the good news, folks. Um, you don't have to be a big nature nerd like me to figure this stuff out. Because I truly believe, and I've seen this over 30 years of working with people in nature, we intuitively know a lot of this stuff. Without even knowing the names of all the birds and the different sounds they make, often I could sit down with a group of people or a couple of people are in the woods and they'll hear something and I'm like, what do you think is going on there? And they're like, I don't know. I'm like, but just pretend, pretend you know. <laughs> pretend you, like, just guess. And they'll say, I don't know, a bird just sounds like it's singing. It's, I don't know, it's just birds singing, I guess it's everything's okay. And I'm like, yeah, that's what I would say. Another time, I was like, what's, what do you think is going on there? Like, I don't know, but that doesn't sound good. It sounds like there's something wrong. We have a really strong sense, and you could call it intuition, you can call it whatever you want, but folks, for a long, 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 long time, we lived outdoors. All of our ancestors, no matter who you are, where you came from, started out here. So we are hardwired to understand and interpret and respond and connect with all the things happening out here. So I encourage people to trust your intuition, to pay attention to your feelings in nature. It sounds all funny, but it's true. What is your body telling you? Like, what, is your, like, what does it feel like when you hear certain noises or see certain things going on? And if you're curious and you feel safe enough, you know, and generally you're gonna be just fine. Very few things wanna harm you or bother you or cause any injury to you out here. Go and be curious, investigate these things. Let your curiosity lead you you know, whether it's out in the backyard or walking in a town park or down by the river, slow down, tune in, pay attention to your senses, and they will lead you to interesting natural mysteries and connections from those mysteries. And you might not get the answers that day. You might be like, well, I don't know what was going on. Was, there was a bunch of crows and they just, you know, and so I, I remember that guy saying, go follow your curiosity. Go see if that's an angry bird or whatever. And you went. And maybe the first time you didn't see it, but the next time you came in slower and quieter. And because you did that, you weren't breaking leaves and sticks and kicking things. You got to see the great horn now swoop off the branch and take off. Because <laughs> often that's what crows are doing. They're mobbing predators they don't like. 
red-tailed hawks, gray horned owls, barred owls, all sorts of things that they just don't like in their neighborhood. They don't like to have around, so they'll, they'll do that. They'll do that mobbing, and that's telling you that they're upset at something. So we can tune into all this stuff. It's not terribly hard. We're hardwired to do it. We just need to kind of give our attention back to nature, take a little break, you know, decrease the screen time, increase the green time, and we practice this stuff, you're going to get better and better at it, and you'll find that it's actually pretty interesting. Oh, some crows just came in and landed. Oh. So while I've been talking, because I'm yapping so much, I'm not hearing a lot, but I am trying to listen at the same time. So there's been the the little nut hatches. There's some grackles over there. And this time of year, you might see big flocks of these black birds kind of coming through the forest. This is a small group, but you can hear Sometimes there are red-winged blackbirds in there. And these birds are all in the middle of migration or somewhere in their migration because here we are in October, fall migration is happening. Billions of birds are moving north to south. Some move east west, but here in our continent. And so a lot of these birds are just coming through. They're kind of like tourists on a road trip. They don't know this area really well. They find any little patch of green that they can and they're gonna fuel up, they're gonna rest, and they're gonna continue on their journey. But while they're here, they are communicating. They're communicating with each other and they're communicating with other things around them. And because there was that time when we all spoke the same language, we know how to listen to that and we know how to pay attention to it. And it's not always certain, you won't always know exactly what's happening, but there's a good chance the more you do it, the more you're going to understand what's happening and the more you're going to see interesting things in nature. You may find yourself led to, um, you know, maybe it's a cat bird is really upset and you go, what the heck is that cat bird so upset about? I didn't even know there is a cat bird. It sounds like a bird, a cat, but it's a bird. So you, you go and look at it and you're looking at it and you notice it's pointing down and then maybe it, underneath its shrub you see a water snake and it, it's, maybe it doesn't like that water snake near its nest or maybe you see a fox curled up or hiding from you. So birds can lead us to all sorts of interesting, cool interactions with wildlife, um, as long as we're giving them our attention and we're kind of following up with some curiosity. So right now, everything sounds pretty happy and pretty chatty. I'm not detecting any trouble around here. A lot of birds are feeding, birds are resting. It's good weather for them, there's no big storms coming. The winds are low. It's just nice and peaceful. So we're at the trailhead of um, Penny Pond. It's a little hiking trail here right next to the Berwick Town Library. Great little spot. So yeah, we're gonna go into the woods here a little bit and see what we notice, see what we hear, uh, see what we can learn from. Let's see, so this time of year, uh, here again, mid-October, a lot of the birds that are moving through here, the migrating birds, they're gonna fuel up on a lot of food sources. They really like a lot of fats when they migrate and a lot of proteins. So they'll be going for larvae of insects as well as adult insects. You know, depending on the size of the bird, bigger birds eat bigger insects, smaller birds, smaller insects. Oh, a, hmm, something landed over there. I'm not sure what it is right now. If I had my binoculars, I should have brought them. They're in the car. <laughs> but you don't, not everyone has binoculars, so I'm trying to be a realistic role model here. So it's a bird sitting upright. It's kind of grayish brown. It's about that big. So I'd say it's about the size of a blue jay. But it's just sitting quietly. And it's kind of sitting upright. Almost like maybe a Phoebe might sit. But I don't think it's a Phoebe. It's like... So it's perfect time. We were just talking about migrating birds and feeding. So there's a group of robins in here, American robins. You could tell that little, they have that orangey breast and that 
kind of gray head, darkish back. Anyway, they're feeding on the winterberry. So winterberry, you may know, people use it as a decoration a lot around the holidays, um, but it is a wetland shrub with these little red berries that stay on even after the leaves fall. So this penny pond trail is great because we are on the edge of a forested swamp, basically a wetland with trees in it. Um, and right now in here, it's great. There's a lot going on. There's bluebirds on these dead trees. So there's like dead trees with little holes all in them, made by woodpeckers mostly, maybe used by a lot of other species. And they're foraging, they're looking, they're peak, taking their little bills and putting them in little cracks to get the fuel they need, the food they need in order to make what are basically epic journeys every single night during migration. Some of these birds are basically doing like ultra marathons, I think 20 nights in a row. It's unbelievable. So they're fueling up heavily and resting and then they'll move at night. So there's a mixed flock of birds in here. I just saw another woodpecker go by. I don't know what it was, but maybe a hairy woodpecker, like a mid-sized one. Robins, chickadees, bluebirds. And this is pretty typical during migration. A lot of birds will spend time in these mixed flocks. And it's, it's number one, it's great for safety. You get safety in numbers, birds that hear and see. And also they tend to eat somewhat different foods. And they also help find foods they all like together. Now there's some sparrows down here. Oh, we got some chipmunk action over here. So if you're going, so you say, you say, all right, this is good. I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I want to learn more about these birds. I want to learn how to better pay attention. Again, the first thing you want to do, just find a little patch, a little patch of green, a little patch of woods, a little patch of field, even your yard, even a, even your back deck, if you can't get, you, know, you say you, you're not mobile, you can't get out into the grass. Find a comfy spot, have a seat. <laughs> Just give it a few minutes. Let things start to calm down, including our own minds. So letting our minds slow down, let ourselves kind of sink in, you know, dress so you can be comfy, right? So you don't want to be too cold, you know, you know maybe bring a little cup of tea if you want or something, or coffee if you feel like it. If you have binoculars, that can be handy to spot things, but if not, you don't need them. It's not a big deal. And if you want to really say, but I really want to get moving. I need to move. I've been sitting around all day doing this work. Okay, fine. So if you're going for a little hike, halfway through your hike, stop and take a 10 minute quiet break. And I mean quiet, like don't sit there and like, oh, we're going to chat, 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 chat. Like just really just zip up for a little bit and watch, look, listen, feel. What's happening around me right now? Ask, what's going on? What can I learn from this? Really trying to prime your curiosity a little bit. Um, if the kind of person wants to learn to know names of things because that helps you feel connection, great. Maybe you could take pictures. You can try and draw things. You can, uh, and then when you get home, you can look them up online or in some field guides, some books or something like that. You can talk to friends about them. Or maybe you just want the connection. You don't really care about the names. That's fine too. <laughs> but you have to take the time to slow down out there. Um, appreciate the little things like right here, this gorgeous tree. It's, this looks like, yeah, it's a great, it's a great tree, but it's got this cool muscular bark. It's actually known as muscle wood or some people call it ironwood. And it grows in these nice rich soils along streams, right? And there's a lot of nice ones out here actually, pretty big too and healthy. So maybe you just find one of those you like. Oh, you just take a little seat next to one of these for a while and you relax. Maybe you haven't relaxed all day. Maybe you haven't taken time off in a long, long time. A five minute little chill sit in the woods might do us all really well. <laughs> you find yourself getting bored, antsy, that's okay too. Especially if you're not used to slowing down, sometimes it's hard, whoa. Got a lot of bird action, blue jays, chickadees, they got alarming chip, chip, chip from the chipmunk. <laughs> There's a lot to take in here. And even when it's quiet, then I just tell myself, what's the quietest sound I can hear? Might be, might be a car in the distance, might be a plane up high, but it might also be this quiet scurrying and the leaf litter of a little mouse or a shrew or something. So give yourself the present of slowing down to be in the present. Give yourself the gift of connection. And I think you'll find yourself, find it rewarding. So as we talk with, hey, hello chipmunk. As we learn to slow down and listen and be in communication with the birds, the other animals, 
Hopefully you'll find some more meaning and connection, some mindfulness, some peace, because this also slows down our blood pressure. Right? It lowers our blood pressure, slows down our heart rate. It's really it's good for us. I mean, there's ample, ample evidence in many fields about how this green time is really important for our well-being. So do it for yourself. Do it for your family, friends. Get out there and enjoy. So thank you so much for tuning in and hope it was helpful for you. And um, I'm going to go leave these chipmunks alone because he's not too happy I'm here right now. But farewell. Take care.